So welcome to the webinar, Alarm Management 101, or Alarm Management Basics. Everything you wanted to know about alarm management, but were afraid to ask. My name is Todd Stauffer. I'm Director of Alarm Management here at Exeter, and we're broadcasting live from the Sellersville Sound Garden Studios. So I am involved with alarm management here at Exeter, as well as part of the ISA Committee on Alarm Management, ISA 18.2, and helped develop one of the standards that we'll talk about on alarm management. So first, a little bit about Exeter. We're a global company that's focused on process safety, cybersecurity, and alarm management. We are a leader in the certification of products and people for safety systems and safety technology. And we have a suite of software for safety instrumented system design to address all phases of the safety life cycle. And as part of that, we include our alarm management software called SIL Alarm. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about alarm management, but in a different style than most of our typical presentations or typical presentations that you would probably see. We're going to do it in a question and answer format. So we'll walk through some typical questions and talk about the best practices that relate to each one. So we'll look at things like what's the purpose of an alarm, how do we determine when an alarm is needed, how do we determine when alarms are redundant, how do we set up a good alarm limit, things like that. So the format will be a question and the answer. Let's start with a, a bit of a grounding about why alarm management is important. So a question, quiz question related to the role of the operator. So the question is, what role in today's society analyzes information, diagnoses situations, predicts outcomes, and takes action to deliver value? Your choices, is it an airline pilot, a medical doctor, an operator, who are all of the above? Well, since we're talking about alarm management and operator, you probably guessed that the answer here is all of the above. Part of the idea is to get you to see that similar to an airline pilot or a flight controller, operators get a lot of information, a lot of data that they need to make quick decisions about, and those decisions have significant impact. One of the best tools for the operator to help them make those quick decisions and to make them correctly is the alarm system in the control system. And that's what we want to talk about, management of the alarms in the alarm system. So how does alarm management affect the operator's performance? Well, if we think about what an alarm is ideally for, if the process is being controlled effectively by the, the DCS, then the process stays in the normal operating range. If something happens, the process may start to deviate and go into the abnormal area. And then ideally, an alarm would be generated. And the purpose of that alarm is to let the operator know that there's an abnormal situation present to help them figure out what's wrong and to guide them to take the appropriate corrective action. The idea is that when they take the corrective action, the process turns around and heads back to the normal operating area. If the operator does not respond or responds incorrectly, then the process may continue to deviate, continue to go away from normal operating conditions, resulting in a process shutdown, perhaps activation of a safety instrumented system or some other type of consequence. So, there's a one-for-one -one correspondence between the creation of the alarm and the need for the operator to respond to prevent something from happening. Now, if your control system, if your alarm system summary screens look like this, where you have tons of alarms displayed constantly, then something's wrong. That one-for-one -one correspondence, the operator responds and the process corrects itself it's obviously not working in this scenario. 
So what does that do and what does that mean to the operator? That's the source of a lot of problems. We'll call them the alarm management villains. And they include just flat out giving the operator too many alarms, whether it's on average kind of steady state or after an upset, we'll call that an alarm flood. Another typical problem is when the operator gets hit with nuisance alarms. This is the idea of alarms that are occurring that don't actually need to be responded to. So they break that one for one cause consequence correlation. Cause operator needs to respond or consequence. In this case, the operator is either responding and the process is not correcting, or the operators may be not even responding and nothing's happening. So the purpose of the alarm is not working in that scenario. And then alarms that either don't have a response, as we said, or alarms where the priority is not meaningful. If these situations are present in your alarm system, that is going to diminish the ability of the alarm system to be an effective tool for the operator. And it's going to make it harder for them to do their job. It's going to make it harder for them to make those quick decisions and to make them correctly. So the alarm system can be a supporter of the operator when it's uh, def defined and managed correctly and appropriately. But when it's not performing well, it actually hurts the operator's performance. So thinking about what alarm management is overall then, we can define it as the process by which alarms are engineered, monitored, and managed to ensure safe and reliable operations. And really the goal of alarm management is to improve the situation awareness of the operator so they can prevent those consequences. They can prevent the trip of the SIS. They can prevent damage to equipment. Uh, and situation awareness is really the ability for the operator to totally be in touch with the process and understand what is happening and to kind of be able to predict what will happen so they can ideally take proactive measures even before the alarms occur. But the idea is they are in touch with the process enough to know what's happening. So now let's talk about what are the most important industry standards and guidelines. Not too much time on this, but there are a couple of standards. One that was created in the US, ISA 18.2, first created in 2009. That led to the creation of an international version called IEC 62682, which came out in 2014. And then after that, the, the ISA 18.2 standard was just uh, recently re-released and, and updated uh, in March. Those are the two main standards that govern process industry customers throughout the world. There's also a guideline document called AMUA 191, which was created in the UK in response to a major accident that they had there, which was an alarm management problem, which contains a lot of good information on best practices for alarms. Uh, so between those three, bodies of knowledge. Those are the, the most important collections of alarm information. Now the ISA standard is supplemented by some technical reports. A standard typically tells you what you need to do, the requirements per se, but not how to do it. So the technical reports go into more detail about applications and examples of how you might do things. So that coupled with the standard gives you a good compendium of alarm management knowledge. So okay, let's start with a, a test. Test your knowledge on alarms. We're going to look at a couple of different scenarios and I want you to take a piece of paper and a pen and write down your answer to these questions. We won't uh, go over them now, we'll go over them later at the end of the webinar and we'll see how you did and uh, whether your answer changes based on what we learn and what we talk about. So the first scenarios that we want to look at are operators are alerted to an abnormally high level in a tank that could result in a spillover or process shutdown without direct operator intervention. 
The second one, operator wants to be notified when our water tank level is low enough for him to restart some wells that have been shut down. So we want to know of those two scenarios, which ones should be alarmed? A or B, perhaps both of them, or perhaps neither. So take a second and write down for yourself what you believe the best answer is. And then we'll move on to the next set of scenarios. So in this one, we have a couple of different ones. A piece of equipment was shut down by the operator from the faceplate. That's the first one. That's A. B, a piece of equipment is shut down and requires operator attention. That's B. So the question is, again, is A an alarm? Is B an alarm? Are both alarm scenarios? Or is neither an alarm scenario? So take a second and write down your answer to that question. We will return to that later in the webinar. So now let's talk about what an alarm actually is or what it's supposed to be as defined in the ISA and IEC standards, same definition. An alarm is supposed to be an audible and or visual means of indicating to the operator, I have the word operator underlined, to emphasize that the operator is the target audience for the alarm system. So all of the information that goes through the alarm system and, and is presented to the operator must be understandable and actionable by the operator where it doesn't belong in the alarm system. Next. An alarm needs to indicate an equipment malfunction, process deviation, or other abnormal condition. And I've highlighted the words abnormal condition to emphasize that an alarm is supposed to be used to mean that something is wrong. Something unexpected has happened. And then last but not least, it requires a timely response. And I don't mean acknowledging the alarm or silencing the horn. They don't count. In this case, response, I mean something that is going to correct the process abnormality, that's going to drive the process back to the normal operating range. So that would be something like turning on a backup pump, opening or closing valves, something like that. Now, one other way to think about alarms is it's just one form of communication to the operator of an event that has occurred in your process or in your process control system. So one of the important things to understand or to focus on when we're looking at all the different notifications that the operators get is to make sure we can clearly differentiate which ones are alarms and which ones are not. So the definition of an alarm helps there. Another way to, to help differentiate is to use this matrix that we see here which basically has you ask kind of two questions related to a notification. Does it require action from the operator, or is it just for informational purposes? And then is the event that it's providing notification of, is it an abnormal or is it an expected event? Based on that, we can classify or categorize alarms and, make, and we want to make sure that during the creation of our alarm system or the setup of our alarm system that we're making sure that alarms are reserved truly for conditions that just meet this one box here of the matrix. So operator action is required and it's an abnormal situation. So why are there so many alarms configured in a typical control system? It's a common question. Um, which leads to many of the problems that we see. So how did we get to the situation that we're in? Part of the problem is in the olden days of panel board control, there was a lot of thought put into what points should be an alarm. And that was because there was limited real estate on the walls for the alarms. And there was actually a real cost to wiring them up. We fast forward to the modern DCS and alarms are essentially now free. They don't cost anything. They're in software. And a typical DCS 
an analog point will have a high, 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 low, low, low rate of change, deviation, PV bad. There can be, you know, eight to ten different alarm possibilities for just a single sensor. And if you don't put thought into which ones you really need, you can end up enabling, you know, all of them or four of them or two of them. And part of the the problem that we have or the problems that we do have arises from the fact that we don't put thought into what alarms we really need. We look at what's available and either enable them all or enable whichever ones we think might be useful without putting in the same kind of thought process that we did in the past where we thought about what is the real purpose of this alarm? What is it there for? And what is the operator going to do? That thought process is actually a key part of what we call alarm rationalization, which is the key to figuring out which alarms you actually need. So now that we know what an alarm is and how the operator is supposed to deal with them, how many alarms can an operator realistically deal with? Now, First, we have to remember that operators, their sole job is not to respond to alarms. In fact, they would prefer getting no alarms. That would be ideal. Alarms are supposed to be an infrequent notification that something is wrong and to draw their attention. So if they spend all of their time responding to, the, to alarms, that would not be good. They would not have time to optimize the production or the, the, uh, the operation itself. So let's take a look at the process for an operator to respond to an alarm. What does it consist of? You can think of it as three different steps. The first step is the operator needs to detect that the alarm actually exists. So this relies heavily on the design of the human machine interface, alarm horns, alarm beacons. So the idea is when an alarm comes in that it immediately can draw the operator's attention. Second step is diagnosing what the problem is and figuring out what the cause and what the operator needs to do, what's the corrective action. And then third step is to perform that corrective action, to respond to the alarm, to open the valve or to turn on the pump. So those three pieces make up the operator's response time. So the question is, if you thought about a 10-minute time period, how many true alarms that an operator needs to respond to can an operator realistically deal with, do you think, in 10 minutes? So take a moment to think about that. While you're thinking about it, uh, make sure you consider not just alarms that can be quickly addressed from a faceplate, in the, the DCS, but also scenarios where the operator may need to call an outside operator or walk out into the plant to find the final control element. So if the corrective action or the final element can't be um, manipulated from the control room, it's going to take a lot more time for the operator to respond, probably on the order of minutes. So that's why the standards based on human factor studies recommend no more than one to two alarms per 10 minutes. And if you think about that detect, diagnose, respond uh, scenario, that seems to make sense as a sanity. Now if you can continue with thinking about 10 minutes and one to two alarms is what the operator can reasonably deal with uh, long term or steady state, what can they deal with uh, short term on a burst after an unplanned event? That's what we call an alarm flood. So essentially overloading the operator temporarily with, with too many alarms. The standards recommend there that you, you try and limit it to no more than 10 alarms in that 10 minute time period or else you're going to start to overwhelm the operator. And what happens when you overwhelm the operator? Well, you can see down here in this table that the likelihood of them making a mistake, either responding incorrectly to the alarm or not doing it in time, 
who are not noticing the alarm, the, the likelihood of them responding incorrectly goes up dramatically in that stressful upset scenario. So that's one of the main reasons why we want to uh, prevent alarm floods from occurring. So now that we've talked about how many alarms an operator can get, how do we figure out which ones they actually need? Try and minimize the alarms they actually get. So how do we determine when, which alarms are needed and which alarms are not? I mentioned earlier, or I hinted earlier, at something called the alarm rationalization process. That's really the key for where you determine what alarms you actually need. And it's a multi-step process that consists of checking the validity of the alarm, and we'll look at that in a second, assessing the consequence if the operator doesn't respond, looking at the, the cause and the corrective action, looking at how much time the operator has to respond, and those are the typically the, the key things that one looks at to determine whether the alarm is valid or not, whether the alarm is really going to be necessary, whether it really has a purpose. And then the rest of the rationalization process includes steps like determining the priority of the alarm, assigning the classification, reviewing the alarm limit, setting attributes like uh, dead band and on-off delay, and then last, uh, assessing whether there's any scenarios where the alarm needs to be suppressed or have a different limit or priority. And that's done in a team setting, and the Exida tool called SIL alarm is a tool that will guide you through the rationalization process, prompt you to make all those decisions and document your results, and then push that information back into your control system. So how do we determine then whether the alarm is valid or not? Well, what we have to work with is the definition of an alarm. So let's take that definition and create some criteria to judge ourselves against. And we can come up with a couple of questions that we can apply, kind of as a, a go, no-go criteria. The first one would be, does the alarm that we're looking at indicate a malfunction, deviation, or abnormal condition? There's that abnormal condition phrase again. You have to answer yes to this question. If you can't answer yes, then the point is not an alarm. Second question. Does it require a timely operator action in order to avoid defined consequences? Again, if you can't answer yes to this question, it really should not be an alarm. Continuing, is it unique or are there other alarms that might be better indicators of the root cause? So these are some of the other criteria that can be applied to determine whether an alarm is valid and needed. And that's just a quick check. So now let's take that knowledge and apply it to a real-life scenario. And the real-life scenario is the design and operation of a typical sump pump. And this comes from an actual drawing for a, a project where the, the definition of how it should work was that there were high and low level alarms defined at 85% and 10% respectively. And the pump, the sump pump, was to be automated to turn on when it reaches the high-level alarm, 85%, and turn off when it reaches the, the low-level alarm at 10%. So if we apply what we just talked about or what we just learned, and think about the high alarm that's defined at 85% and run it through our criteria, first criteria is, does it indicate an abnormal condition? And the answer would be no. Not as it's currently constructed. The level is going to increase enough that the pump is going to need to turn on. That's the way it's designed to work. Second, does it require a timely operator action? And the answer is no. The operator doesn't have to do anything. The pump is, is turning on automatically the way this is designed. So that would indicate that the high alarm is really not required. It's not a valid alarm. So now let's continue with the rest of the rationalization process that helps us understand whether we need an alarm or not. It's called the alarm objective analysis. And we look at four different things. First being, what is the likely cause of the alarm? We want to make sure that the alarm is an unexpected event, not expected. And we want to make sure that we're looking at the root cause. So when we look at uh, 
a low flow alarm, we want to know the root cause, not the cause being cause of a low flow alarm being low flow, which I've seen on projects, as opposed to uh, a clogged filter or a clogged strainer, something like that. That's more along the line of the root cause that we're looking for. Next, look at the consequence. And for this, we want the, the direct consequence. What's going to happen if the operator doesn't respond? Let's assume every other layer of protection, every other safeguard in the plant is going to work the way it's supposed to. So what only would happen if the operator doesn't respond? In this scenario that we have here, this picture, the consequence of the operator not responding would be the trip of the safety system. Then we want to document what the corrective action is. And of course, we're looking at something other than acknowledging the alarm. We're talking about opening a valve, turning on a pump, things like that. And then last, ideally, we want to document how the operator can confirm that the alarm is real, particularly if the operators have been subjected to nuisance alarms where they don't trust the alarm system. We want to provide them with additional information so they can help make the decision that, in this case, this is an important alarm and I need to respond to it. Now, when we go through this analysis, if we can't come up with a consequence of what's going to happen, or the only consequence is another alarm, then we don't need that alarm. Similarly, if we can't define what the corrective action is for the operator to take, it's also not an alarm. So the objective analysis, in addition to the validity check, helps us, again, refine what points should be an alarm and which should not. So now let's go back to our sump pump example. We eliminated the original high level alarm at 85 percent, but if we just left it at that and moved on, we'd be doing a, a disservice to the situation because there really still is an undesirable situation, a, a scenario that we want to avoid, a hazardous scenario. There is the potential for one there. So what is that undesirable situation? Well, if the sump pump doesn't work, where it gets overloaded, can't keep up with demand, then the sump will overflow and spill out. So that is a potential hazardous scenario. So if we created an alarm for that, what would the operator action be? Well, they would need to go out and check what's happening, whether there's a malfunction with the pump or you know something like that or a failure. And then what would the consequence be if the operator doesn't respond? What would be a spill? Uh, the sump pump would overflow, and depending upon what's in it, that could have minor to significant environmental consequences. So what we've just determined is that we actually need a high-high alarm here that would basically indicate that the sump pump is not working, so something where the limit is greater than 85%, so let's say 90 or 95%, something in there, uh, that indicates sump pump is not working or not able to keep up with demand. And this is a real-life situation, so let's look at an example of where that rationalization makes a difference and caused a problem. So in this chemical plant, they were transferring reagent into a neutralization area, and that pump developed a significant leak, which filled up the sump. It also caused a lack of reagent flow to the neutralization area, which upset that whole entire process and made the operator scramble to figure out what was going on and to address that. Now, the operator did receive a high and a high, high level alarm for the sump, but they ignored them. And they ended up overflowing the sump, as we talked about, and dumping 10,000 gallons in the environment there. Now, they regularly ignored the high-level alarm on the sump because, as we just talked about, it was actually used as the set point to start the pump. So if we look at the failure modes for this, the operator did not understand that the cause of the upset in the neutralization area was actually not in the neutralization area. It was some, somewhere else. But one of the major problems in this scenario is 
rationalization was not performed correctly. The fact that that high level alarm was still there, the one that we had eliminated, meant that the operator ignored it. Because every time it goes off, that's just indication that the pump is starting. It's not an alarm. So the operator developed a culture that he could ignore all the alarms coming from the sump pump. Well, that was true for the high level alarm, but not for the high high. Uh, so when that occurred and they ignored them as well, that led to the problem. So in correct application of alarming and alarm rationalization led to a 10,000 gallon spill in this case. So then how do we take that further and determine when alarms are redundant? So for example, when is it okay to have both a high and a high high alarm? In the past, we might have configured a high high alarm with the idea that if the operator misses the high alarm, then the high high would be the backup. It would be the, the catch off where and hopefully you're kind of seeing that that's not a productive or good way to set up your alarm system. So what we want to do is analyze for each alarm, each potential alarm, high and high, high in this case, what is the cause of the alarm, what is the consequence, what is the corrective action, the operator response, and something needs to be different between the two alarms for those three criteria. If nothing is different, if they're the same for the high and the high, high alarm, then you have duplicate alarms and you don't need both of them. So let's look at a little bit more of one of the criteria here, which was the operator response needing to be different in kind or degree. Let's dive into that a little bit more. So if we look at this tank example and you're the operator um, and you're going to get high level and high, high level alarms, and the question is, what do you do? Uh, for this tank, the only thing you have control over is the manual valve. So what would the operator response be when they get the first high level alarm? It might be to reduce the flow through that manual valve, so close it partially. But what if that doesn't work and the level continues to rise, reaching the high, high level point? Now what does the operator do? Well, they would stop the flow entirely, close off that valve completely. So that shows an example of where the response is different in kind or degree between those two examples. In one case, we're reducing. In the other case, we're totally shutting off the flow. So now, how do we define a useful limit for an alarm, an alarm set point? Well, if we think about the operational scenario that we saw earlier, hopefully the DCS is keeping control of the process and keeping your process variables, let's say your pressure, in your normal operating envelope or your normal operating range. But let's say it loses control and the pressure starts to increase. There's some value that we don't want the pressure to get to where the consequence will occur. What is that? point. That's the consequence threshold. So we need to know what that, that value is. We need to know what that consequence threshold is to be able to set the alarm limit. So let's say for pressure for a vessel, the consequence of high pressure will be a relief valve opening. So the consequence threshold would be the set point for the relief valve. And what do we do with that information? Well, that represents the value of the process that we don't want the, the pressure to get to. So we want to set our alarm limit in reference to that consequence threshold. And if we know the rate of change of the process, we can set an alarm limit that gives the operator sufficient time to respond effectively before the increase in pressure to reach the consequence threshold. <clears throat> so the, the takeaway is alarm limits are set in relation to consequence barriers or constraints, design constraints that you have. So in this case, it was a pressure relief valve setting. It could be a safety instrument and system setting. It could be an interlock setting. It could be a maximum design pressure. It could be a mechanical integrity limit. So there are many different design constraints 
and you need to know what they are because that's what you're looking at to set the alarm limit. Now you can't just set the alarm limit and walk away because if you don't look at other attributes like hysteresis or deadband, you're going to end up with nuisance alarms. And what deadband does is there's typically uh, signal noise in your process variables. So let's say we set our alarm limit at 60 PSI and our pressure fluctuates. Well, every time it goes up above 60, it generates an alarm. And then let's say just because of the fluctuation on the next scan of the DCS, it drops below. And then it goes above and then drops below. Well, we'll end up with four different alarm instances or four different alarm events just because of the fluctuation in the process variable. And that's a, a chattering alarm. So that's a nuisance to the operator. By configuring a dead band, we make it so that the alarm needs to clear a certain gap uh, before it would actually be cleared or, or it would be eliminated from the screen for the operator. So that essentially smooths out a chattering alarm and takes it from a multi-alarm event to a single alarm, eliminating chattering. So a little bit more about how dead band works. If you had a, a situation where you had a pressure um, gauge that was scaled from 0 to 100 PSI and your high alarm limit was set at 90 with a dead band of 2%, the alarm would be triggered any as soon as or any time the pressure goes above 90. And then it would not clear or return to normal until the pressure dropped below 88. And any fluctuations between 90 and 88 would not result in any additional alarms. So that's essentially how we get rid of chattering alarms. In addition to dead band, there's parameters such as on delay and off delay, which can also smooth out that chattering, but from a, a time-based point of view rather than from the, a value-based point of view. And part of the reason why that's this dead band is important is because it um, influences when the alarm will uh, clear. I mean, you could, uh, here's an example of an alarm summary display from a DCS where it shows both the uh, alarm limit and the live value. So the operator could actually see the live value be less limit, less than the high limit, and say, how come it hasn't cleared yet? And it would be because of that dead band. And if it wasn't set appropriately, they might, it might be a, a stale alarm. And, and I've actually seen some scenarios where operators will go in and change the dead band temporarily to zero to clear out that alarm and then change it back so that it disappears from the screen once it's cleared. So, okay, moving on to the next question. How do you let the operator know which alarm to respond to first, or how do they know? Well, we're going to primarily focus on the, the HMI, the human-machine interface. That's going to draw their attention and hopefully give them the information that they need to know as to which, which situation is most critical that they need to respond to first. And if you look on this screen, you can see one set of visual images, and if you look for certain alarms that are kind of difficult to see, compared to this screen where you can see that the alarms really stand out. They really jump off the page so that the operator can clearly see them, and that's the, the goal, that's the idea, that's the way you should design. So the coloring and the priority and the visibility within the human-machine interface should correlate to how important or critical the event is or the alarm. And what the best practice is is that you only use um, yellows and reds and abnormal colors for alarms. Everything else, normal states, would not be those bright colors to draw the operator's attention because we want it we want to make it very easy to the operator to differentiate when there's an alarm there. Now the color of the alarm usually is connected to its priority. And what is the priority? That's actually what the operator needs to key off of or should be able to key off of to know which alarm do I respond to first. Now, if you have a system where you only ever have one alarm at a time, guess what? doesn't matter what the priority is. But if you're like 99.5% of 
the rest of the process plants, you get multiple alarms at the same time. And the idea is the operator needs to have some way of knowing which alarm is more critical to the, the plant, to the business, to the process. If they can only respond to one at a time, which one do they pick? And that's what priority is used to guide them for. So we need to come up with some way of how the heck do you assign the priority of the alarm? Typically by looking at the severity of the consequences, you know, essentially what would occur if the operator didn't respond and how much time the operator has to respond. And the idea is the combination of that is what determines what the priority is. So in this example, if an alarm had this significant financial consequence, we assess how bad its consequence is as part of rationalization and we estimate its amount time to respond, time available, that would indicate that the alarm should be a critical priority. So the operator would know that whenever that alarm, whenever a critical priority alarm occurs, there are significant potential consequences behind that, including not only a uh, significant financial, but the possibility, if you look up here in this cell, that one of their colleagues could get hurt or killed. So there's a relation to from the priority to the significance from a business point of view for them to respond to that alarm. So how do we then let the operator know what action they should take when the alarm occurs? This is particularly important for plants that have a lot of new operators or turnover for uh, operators. The ISA standard defines something called an alarm response procedure. And the idea is the operator can access that and look at that to know how they should act or respond when the alarm occurs. What type of information should be in that uh, procedure? Well, it should in include the, the name of the alarm, the set point, and then information like what's the potential cause of the alarm, what's the consequence, what's the action they're supposed to take, how much time do they have to respond? So information that will truly help them know how to respond to the alarm. And the good news, if you want to call it that, is those are the same things that we talk about during alarm rationalization. If you remember the discussion about alarm objective analysis, what's the cause, what's the consequence, what's the corrective action, we need to document and talk about that information during rationalization. So if we do that, then we can farm that information or leverage that information and turn it into alarm response procedures. And we can actually do that very easily with our SIL alarm tool. Here's an example of where the, the rationalization information can directly populate uh, an alarm help faceplate in the DCS. So how do we then manage alarms that are special? For those of you out there like my friend Charlie, that focus on safety, how do we know which alarms are safety related or safety important? Well, that's through a process called alarm classification. And classification is basically used to group alarms that have common sets of requirements for how they're treated. So just like passengers are treated differently in first class and economy class, you know, certainly the amount of seating you have, <clears throat> the number of free drinks that you get is very different. So not all alarms are created equally. Uh, some alarms, for example, those that have safety potential consequences, you might want to test more frequently than your average process alarm or make sure that the management of change process is much more rigorous. The last thing you want is somebody to disable a safety alarm and you have an accident or somebody gets hurt. So the way to help prevent that is to identify which alarms have these different characteristics by defining these classifications. So common ones here are related to safety. Now both the ISA and the IEC standard define a special superclass of alarms called highly managed alarms. And this is an identification of one or more classes that you've defined that requires 
whole set of special requirements, extra special treatment, like safety alarms. Safety alarms is typically a good example of what uh, a highly managed alarm would be. And the standards define specific requirements for what you must do in the management of those alarms, whether it's how you test them, how frequently you test them, how you document that, the training for the operators on how they know what to do, um, periodic testing and benchmarking. The whole idea is that you're treating those alarms with a lot more rigor um, because of how important they are. So for example, if we look at an analyzer shed, the alarm that essentially tells you that you shouldn't go in there, we really want that to work because the last thing we want to do is to have that alarm not work and somebody goes in there and, and they're killed. So that's an example of a safety alarm and that's why we have these extra special requirements in place for those types of alarms to make sure that they'll work when they need to. So now the next question, how do we make sure that alarms occur only when they are needed? Well, we can apply a couple of different techniques, one of which falls under the category of advanced alarming. Uh, we can talk about a concept called suppression, which means we actually hide the alarm from the operator. We don't present it to them under certain situations situations when we know that the alarm is not relevant. So there's a couple of different ways to implement that. So one application example would be, for example, we have a pump and we have alarms on the outlet pressure or the discharge pressure or perhaps on the outlet flow. And we have a low discharge pressure alarm. And of course that's going to go off anytime the pump stops. So that alarm is not useful in that scenario. That would be a nuisance alarm. So we would want to do something special to prevent that low discharge pressure from enunciating anomalously. So we could do that two different ways. We could set up a, a state-based suppression where we look at whether the pump is running and, and use that to suppress the uh, low discharge pressure. Or we can just change the criteria for when the, the pressure, the low pressure alarm goes off and look at more than just the actual pressure reading, the pressure measurement itself, but also look at the status of the pump running as part of that alarm expression. So it's kind of like it goes from uh, the pressure must be less than 20 psi to the pressure must be less than 20 PSI and the pump must be running. So we change the expression for when the alarm is generated and we've made it smarter so that it will only occur when it's providing useful information. So that's one example. Another example relates to um, flooding of alarms to the operator after uh, an equipment trip like a compressor where we're going to end up with a whole bunch of alarms that are kind of triggered as, a, as an effect, an after effect of the compressor tripping. So we can define a way to suppress the alarms, first by detecting or looking for what might trigger the compressor trip or how we would know that the compressor is tripped. And then we can set up logic to say when that happens, when we detect that in the control system, here's the set of alarms that need to be suppressed. And as part of the review and identification process there, we'd want to make sure that the alarms truly could be suppressed and that there was no safety implications being overshadowed by that. Okay, so now we're, we're coming to the end. We're coming to the wrap-up portion. Now we're going to go back to the, 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 uh, the quiz questions that we looked at earlier. So this is the final exam for this webinar. So let's look at the, the questions that we saw earlier and talk about what the correct answer is. So, and hopefully you've learned something along the way in this webinar that helps solidify 
you were understanding and thinking and, and coming up with the correct answer as well. So the question was, which scenario should be alarmed? Scenario A, operators are alerted to an abnormally high level. In scenario B, the operator wants to be notified. Is it uh, one or the other, both or neither? And the answer in this case is A. So operators are alerted to an abnormally high level in a tank. And the reason why it's A is if we read the description, and, it, and this is kind of a lesson learned that if we can take the alarm and truly document from a narrative point of view what it's supposed to do, kind of in this fashion, it can become pretty clear whether it should be an alarm or not. So that's one of the things that you want to try and do to help you make that decision. And of course, in this case, it is an abnormal situation. There's a consequence that's going to occur if the operator doesn't respond. So it meets all of our criteria. Now, B, not quite so sure. Given that uh, the description that we have here, it looks almost like a a prompt to the operator to tell them to, to do something, something that's kind of a normal thing. So it doesn't look like it meets the criteria for being an alarm, at least based on this description. So next scenarios. A piece of equipment was shut down by the operator from the faceplate and a notification that it is provided that it has stopped. Second one, piece of equipment is shut down and requires operator attention to find the problem and restart the equipment. Is it A, B, C, or D? In this case, the answer is B. If we look at scenario A, that's essentially an alarm being generated when the operator does something and does it successfully. So it sounds kind of crazy when you look at it from that point of view and obviously shouldn't be an alarm, but I bet if you're in a plant right now and you walk out to your control room, you will find some alarms that are just like that, that occur when the operator does something and gets the response that they want, actually. So it's a very relevant example. Now in scenario B, we need the operator to go and figure out what's happening and, and restart the equipment. So that's clearly an alarm. Bonus question. Which scenario should be alarmed in this case? A, a PLC's memory support battery is low and needs to be changed. B, power has failed to a PLC and will result in a plant shutdown if power is not restored before the backup batteries run down. So is it A, B, C, or D? This one is a little bit trickier. The answer here is B, but it really depends on what the operator's action would be for scenario A. Clearly, if you read the description for B, there's a eminent consequence that requires the operator to do something, so that's pretty clearly an alarm. If we look at A, that doesn't necessarily look like it meets the criteria for being an alarm, but it really depends on what would the operator be responsible to do in that case. If there's action on the operator's part, then it's really just for informational purposes. On the other hand, if the operator is the one that's responsible for notifying maintenance or creating a maintenance work order, then it is a valid alarm. So it really depends on what the operator's response would be and actually your alarm philosophy toward how operators deal with diagnostic alarms. So that kind of wraps up our session for today. I uh, say thank you very much for attending and tuning in. Appreciate your uh, support, and hopefully you found this uh, an enjoyable webinar. If you did, I would um, encourage you to go to the Exeter website where we have a, a whole bunch of other webinars that have been recorded from previous times. There's a series on alarm management as well as on various other topics. So please feel free to check them out. 
And if you have any questions or comments on what we talked about, my email address is there at the, the bottom. So on that note, I'll say uh, thank you very much for attending, and we hope that you'll join another webinar in the future, and have a good day.